can follow me on Twitter. Uh, and if you're interested in seeing sort of uh, behind the scenes of the open source process, um, I've started doing live streamed code reviews with Apache Spark. Um, we have about 500 open pull requests. And um, I, this way I set aside some time to review code. But also, hopefully, maybe I can trick some of you into helping me review this code. Um, so far, the, the second part of that plan has not actually worked out so well, but I'm optimistic that, that it will. Um, and if you happen to be interested in Spark, I have a bunch more videos on Spark. In addition to who I am professionally, I am trans, queer, Canadian, in America on a work visa, uh, which is a real exciting time to be here on an H-1B visa. Yeah. Um, and part of the leather community. Um, and this is not directly related to functional programming, um, not even Scala. There is no secret Canadian garbage collector, although I wish there was. Oh, dear God. Oh, dear God. Um, OK. Yeah, so I'm hoping you're nice people. Um, I'm sure that everyone loves pictures of cats. Uh, if you don't, there is a second track. Um, and possibly know some Apache Spark. Looks like not that much, but that's OK. We'll, we'll roll with it kind of slowly. Um, and maybe you're here because you're interested in stealing things from Python. Um, or more accurately, not rewriting NLP libraries uh, for the seventh time. Just use the ones that some people made. I'm getting a lot of nods, so that's exciting. Uh, so we'll, we'll focus a lot on that and how the happiness happens. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what PySpark is um, and how we can use it from the JVM. I'm glad I left those slides in. I was debating whether or not it was a good fit for the audience, so that's good. Um, and then I'll look at how to flip how PySpark works on its head so that we can use PySpark to get access to things in Python from the JVM. Um, then once we discover how incredibly slow that is, uh, we'll look at ways to make it go faster. Um, and then we'll look at other things that we can do. I'll try and get you to buy my book. And um, there are two stuffed animals. And that's really all I have for the agenda. Um, but feel free to stop me with questions, especially if there's Spark things which don't make sense. Like, just, just stop me, it's fine. So um, I want to be clear, one of the things which happens when I give talks like these is people come up to me afterwards and they're like, wow, Spark is terrible. What should I use instead? Um, and the answer is, everything sucks. So don't worry. Uh, we're going to talk about a lot of software which is really bad, but all of your other options are also terrible. So um, go team. Uh, so most of the, the tools in this space work by using a combination of pickling, uh, which is a Python serialization format, JSON, uh, raw strings, and then some people looked at that combination and said, you know what this needs is XML. Um, and that was probably maybe true, um, except then, then life was sad. Um, and then we have all of these different lovely formats, which are all um, incredibly not space efficient. And uh, rather than use shared memory buffers, almost everyone uses a combination of Unix pipes and sockets for communication, uh, which is just super portable. And uh, in case you can't tell, sarcasm is a big thing for me. Um, and so this is all really slow. Um, but it's, it's getting a little bit better. Um, so PySpark is the Python interface to Spark. Um, you might not use it. This is more functional programming people. But for people who are working in the Python world, this is how they can do big data e things um, on top of existing clusters and, and ecosystems. Um, it's fairly mature. Um, this doesn't mean that it's good. It just means it's been around for long enough that it's had a lot of the bugs kicked out of it. Um, it has some serious performance hurdles that we'll look at, uh, especially in the case of how we can use it. Um, and the, the important thing to note is it follows the same general uh, sort of design of, of all of the other things which interface with Spark. So the C Sharp interface to Spark, the R interface to Spark, even the Julia interface to Spark all go um, down this path. Um, the one exception is the JavaScript interface to Spark um, decided to do something completely different because eh, that's JavaScript. Why not? Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that as well. So yeah, um, this uses pickling, sockets, pipes, and JSON. And I don't have a funny image for JSON. Um, someone once suggested I get one of those like masks for the murdering people. And I was just like, that is far too real. And also, that's XML. Um, and so it, 
this perhaps <coughs> is designed to ensure you that uh, no, this design has grown organically. Um, and you can definitely see because no one would put these things together intentionally. Um, and so how does, how does this actually work? Um, there's the driver program, which is responsible for a lot of coordination. Um, and there's also the executors, which are responsible for a lot of the work. And because we are engineers in only the broadest sense of the word engineer, I'm not legally allowed to call myself an engineer in my home country. But uh, we use different serialization mechanisms on the driver program and the workers. And that just never causes problems. N never, never. Um, so we use this thing called Pi4J on the driver. And we're actually going to depend on that a lot, unfortunately. Um, has anyone used Pi4J? My sincerest condolences slash congratulations to that one person. Um, Pi4J is really cool. It's amazing. Um, and it's another one of those things which is just inherently kind of a nasty problem to solve. Um, and unfortunately, you, you feel that when you're working with it. Or at least I do. Um, it, it can be a little rough. Um, we use a custom version of the pickle serializer because we wanted to do things differently. And then we decided to use a different format for data frames, because that seemed like a good idea. Um, you don't have to worry about this too much. Just understand that everything is terrible. And when it breaks, your life is going to be pretty sad. Um, and this, this high quality design, uh, in addition to illustrating that I have no designers to work with me, um, can show you that here we use Pi4J on the driver program, and on the workers we just use pipes to pass the data back and forth. And I've left out the part where we use sockets to communicate extra pieces of information in a side channel because that's just depressing. And there's actually also files in there too for good measure. Yay! OK, so how do we flip this around, right? This is very much Python talking to Java or the JVM. In this case, the JVM refers to Scala mostly. But if you wanted to call Python code from Java, that's a totally fine life choice and no judgment, um, or some, some small amount of judgment. Uh, but we, we want to do this in sort of in reverse. So the first thing is rather than having Python launch Java, we'll have Java launch Python. Um, Instead of going into Spark's default entry point, which is very focused around sensible things for solving problems, we're going to provide our own entry point for doing silly things to entertain us. Um, and we're going to define Java interfaces and implement matching interfaces in Python, because types are kind of annoying um, when you have to work across uh, three different languages. It's, it's really not the most fun part, but it, it, it works. Oh, and uh, I forgot to animate that properly. OK, but so we have the JVM startup, shells, sets up a shells out into Python, sets up some pipes and sockets. And then the Python process is going to call back into the JVM with Pi4J. And it's going to use Spark um, and its friend startup.py, uh, which it's like naming the decrepit warehouse like storage center. Um, it sounds really reasonable. And that's, that's what counts when people are skimming through your code base, right? They're like, startup.py. Oh, that sounds like a totally fine design. I probably don't need to read it. And that's true. You really don't. And if you do, sadness. OK, so um, OK, once again, fucked up on the slides, but that's OK. The JVM is going to essentially ask Python, hey, here's a thing I want to do. And then Python is going to handle uh, a function back to the JVM for the JVM to be able to execute. But this function is a Python function. So, so it's going to hand us a thing. But notably, I, uh, I can't execute um, Python bytecode inside of the JVM. But it's, it's OK. It'll give me some Python bytecode. And then if we think back to that earlier architecture diagram, we'll go and we'll spin up some Python workers to deal with that for us. Um, and so this is the new design, more or less. Um, and if this sounds not like entirely off the wall ideas, um, there is a project which demonstrates this. It's called Sparkling ML. Um, and it's 
not just for crazy ideas that I came up with while drinking way too much coffee. Um, you could also put reasonable things in there. Um, if anyone has reasonable things they would like to contribute, that would help make my ideas look more reasonable. Um, <clears throat> but it, at its core, it, it has a lot of wrappings to make it easier to expose Python transformers into Scala land and vice versa. Um, and there's, there's a GitHub repo you can check out if you want to go see the code. Um, so what, what goes inside of startup.py? Where does, what does all of this madness entail? So um, it gives a standard interface for the JVM to call um, with parameters to ask uh, Python to register a function. So if we think about it, uh, we'd have an interface for the JVM to tell us it wanted to call a function in Spacey, tell us what the function name was, tell us what the parameters were, and all of those things. Um, and it can construct these Python UDFs, and it can return Java-ish UDFs. Um, and it's mostly boilerplate, but if you're tired of being happy, you can go and look at it. Um, and this is, this is the part of it which, which looks reasonable, right? Like this part says just like, I implement um, the Python registration provider. It's a very Java friendly name. It has the word provider in it. Doesn't really say what it does. It's a good Java class name. Um, and uh, then register function starts to get a, oh, okay, a little less fun. Um, and, and this is because uh, we don't know necessarily what the types are that you're going to be passing in, right? Um, and this is because life is, life is full of sadness. Um, so let's, let's walk through this depressing code, because um, that's, that's fun. Um, so, so the first part here is uh, if, if we're called, it's possible that we don't have a link back to our parent yet. So we set up our link back to our parent just in case it's not around so that we can register our UDFs on the Spark context. Uh, on the other hand, if that's fine, then that's great. Um, hopefully, the function name which we're asked to register is like a real function that we are, know how to provide. Um, if not, uh, because debugging is really, really painful when you're going between Scala to Java to Python and back, instead of throwing an exception, we'll just print it out to standard out. Because <laughs> at least then I can see it. Because if I throw an exception, my exception gets eaten and hidden away somewhere for me that I can't find. So that's great. Um, and uh, so, OK, we'll, we'll find our function. We'll take our parameters, which are passed into us, and we'll evaluate them. This is almost like calling eval. But it's OK, because we're just talking amongst ourselves, more or less, right? If we provided this functionality to someone malicious, they could indeed have us execute arbitrary code. But this is a framework for executing arbitrary code. So that's kind of OK. Um, so we'll, we'll take our parameters and we'll, we'll convert them into the Python types. Um, and then we'll construct a user-defined function. We'll get the underlying JVM object representing it. And we'll hand that back to the person who called us. Um, and there's, there's the matching boilerplate code yeah, is actually, um, because of how Pack4j works, it is actually a Java interface. And I figured it would be in poor taste. At, at Lambda World to show Java interfaces, but if you want to go see the Java interfaces, you can uh, go click on this link. I will post these slides to Twitter, and then you can go click on this link. I should have put the link text there. Um, but it's, it's pretty much what you would expect. Um, and so now we're going to count some words. Yes, this is a big data talk, so I have to have word count. It's, it's a licensing requirement. Um, some instructors do get away with it. There's a lot of big data instructors nowadays. But as one of the original guild members, I think it's important to uphold our traditions of counting words. Um, and, and in fact, this is actually uh, surprisingly relevant um, f for me. My, my first job out of college uh, was building a recommendation engine at the small local bookseller that you have here in Seattle. Um, and then. Uh, we, we had this slight problem wherein it, it worked well enough in America, and they asked us to make it work in other countries. And I was like, well, that sounds fine. We'll just run it in these other countries. And then it turned out that other languages are different. It was very inconvenient, especially to like 21-year-old Holden, who was just like, 
what do you mean they don't have spaces in Japanese? But, oh dear. Um, and so then we, we just, uh, I shouldn't say how we solved it because it was terrible, but um, if I was solving the same problem today, we could use Spacey, which has like actual really cool models for, for doing these things. Um, and so that's the spacey magic.get lang, um, and we could get a Japanese spacey model, which would actually be able to tokenize Japanese text. So we can have an international word count. Okay, I am the only person who's excited about that. That is all right. Um, okay, so um, we, we can go ahead and then we, we get our tokens from calling spacey and we, we convert them into dictionaries because the spacey tokens actually represent like objects in, with C pointers that don't really serialize all that well when you try and pass them in between different memory spaces, right? That's just not gonna go well. So we'll, we'll convert them into dictionaries and pretend that's acceptable. Okay, um, and then we can go ahead and we can use this from the JVM with, with Scala. Yay! There's, there's, there is some Scala code here. Um, <clears throat> And we'll even test it. Um, because this is big data, I will test it with something which produces three results. That's how we know it's big. Two results, small data. Three results, big data. Oh no, my unicorn horn. Give me a second. Ah. Sorry. It's uh, first time wearing the unicorn horn for uh, giving a talk. It does reduce my peripheral vision just a little bit. Um, but okay, so we, we do it in English anyways because it turns out that uh, while I know Japanese doesn't have spaces, I also don't know Japanese. Um, so that, that just really wasn't gonna work for our unit test. Um, and we, we set our input column and our output column, and then we call transform and, and we collect the result. And this is kind of cool, um, or at least it is to me, right? Uh, with this, I am able to call Python code, and that's, that's kind of neat. And not only am I able to call Python code, um, this Python code could be running on a few hundred computers, which is really good because it's kind of slow, um, which we'll get to, yeah, that part. Okay, so uh, let's say we did this, right? We've, we've solved our problem, but then we try and run it. And it's like, well, it worked fine for three. I mean, it, it, it took a few minutes because it had to start up a JVM, Python VM, and then make a bunch of files and create a socket. But, you know, it, it worked fine for three. But now when I try and do this for um, one, million records, Dr. Evil style, actually now one terabyte of data is a modern equivalent, but yeah, yeah. So if, if we think back to our architecture, that, that does not look, not look fast, right? This does not make you go, wow, this code is gonna be so great and so easy to debug. You look at this and you go, well, that, uh, that might work if we're lucky. Um, and so, yeah, we got some changes to make. Uh, okay, so what about if we tried Jython? Any, anyone? Has anyone here used Jython? Okay, <clears throat> when, I, when I suggested that to a Python audience, they, they laughed. Um, but it's, it's okay, uh, it is actually much faster. <laughs> wow, so much faster. The only problem is, uh, it doesn't work. Uh, or more specifically, none of the cool things I want to do work. So if I try and use Spacey, uh, Jython more or less goes well now. Uh, I don't know how to translate Fortran into, uh, well, this is not Fortran, but I don't know how to translate these native function calls uh, into the JVM for you. And you're like, oh, well, okay. And then, then when you look underneath most Python libraries, you find out that what actually your Python library is, is it's this nice shiny wrapper across some Fortran code that no one understands from the 70s. Um, and fundamentally, while we can translate the wrapper really well, you still have to figure out how to talk to that Fortran code. And trust me, you don't want to be the person whose job is to figure out how to talk to that Fortran code. I have been that person, and they did not pay me enough. Um, so, uh, it's, it's a lot faster, but pretty much impractical. Um, but that being said, I do have a benchmark that implies that it's good. So um, this is a good reminder of just how accurate benchmarks can be. Um, so we can see here, we can get our word count to run almost as fast as native word count. That's exciting. 
<clears throat> okay, or, or not exciting, that's fine. So um, what about if there was a different solution? So this talk actually has happy parts in it. I saved them for the end though, don't worry. So um, instead, we could use this thing called arrow. Has anyone played with Apache arrow? Uh, there's actually a whole bunch of arrows. No, no Apache arrow users, okay. Um, so Apache Arrow is this really cool interchange format which promises to allow you to transfer data as fast as this cat transfers galaxies while eating catnip. Uh, which is pretty damn fast. Um, that cat has had a lot of catnip. Um, and there's a benchmark from a vendor. But, but do remember the previous benchmark that I just showed you and how <clears throat> illuminating that was as to the quality of the solution that I had proposed. Um, and this benchmark implies that we could be 242 times faster. Does anyone believe that? Okay, well, good job. Um, uh, we might be 50% faster. That's, that's still better than nothing, right? Uh, it's not 242 times, though. It's a little awkward, though, because I used to work for this guy. Um, but it's, it's fine. Uh, you also saw my benchmark, which was a complete lie. So. We <clears throat> we all know how to do them. So um, here's the one which is actually 242 times faster. If all we're doing is um, computing the, uh, the, if all we're doing is normalizing our data um, with the mean and standard deviation, uh, we can make it a lot faster. Things are very happy. And this, uh, this is in part because we're just passing around certain types of numeric data, which it's highly optimized for handling. However, um, if we wanted to actually use this for our original problem, which is word count, which I'm sure is a good representative of what everyone here wants to do. Um, it's, uh, oh, actually, wait, no, sorry, this is sentiment analysis. I, I wanted to do numeric data first, because then it looked good. Um, <clears throat> we'll get to the part where it looks bad later. So, okay, sentiment analysis. Maybe in addition to wanting to know what the words are, we want to know if Shakespeare was angry or happy in each of the plays Shakespeare wrote, right? Um, and we need to use thousands of computers to determine this because our research grant expires at the end of the summer. Um, so we, we can use NLTK and, uh, and we can write this fun little lambda function. Or more accurately, the grad student in the other lab wrote this with NLTK. I want to integrate it into my work, but I don't want to switch my entire thing into Python. And that's OK. Um, we can just go ahead and start calling their Python code. Um, and, and that's fine. Uh, and we can, we can check that boo is happy is indeed a relatively happy statement. Um, so that's fine. Um, and, but we can, we can get back to our word count, and we can use, we can use spacey again. And the only sort of different part from our earlier code is rather than taking in individual elements and operating on them one at a time, is we take in a series. Um, and the series is backed by arrow, but we can treat it like a pandas series. Um, or <clears throat> your grad student who likes Python can treat it as a panda series. And then they can write their happy code and, and apply it across the series. Um, <clears throat> there, there, there is sort of an interesting design choice here, um, where if you're familiar with Spark, you might be going, why, why didn't we say produce the document and then you know, produce the tokens right as two separate stages? And there's um, some interesting problems around serialization, which if anyone's feeling too optimistic at the end of this talk, I'm happy to talk to you about. Um, but that's, that's okay. Um, and in part, you, you may notice the other part of this code that's different is now we're just returning the token names. We're not returning the tokens and the token attributes that Spacey was giving us. Um, and this is because uh, Arrow and Sparks integration doesn't support returning map types right now. Um, so we could return an array type and manually reconstruct it into a map, but that would be a lot of code and I'm kind of lazy. Uh, so we're just going to return just the raw tokens, because that's a lot simpler. Um, <clears throat> if you, if you want to fix this, pull requests are indeed welcome. Um, and that would be into the Apache Spark project. Um, Arrow already supports returning map types as of 0.6. Uh, OK, oh, um, Beam is another thing that I also more or less follows the same design. But because it's made by Google initially, they use different technologies for all of the components. So rather than using pickling, um, 
and sockets. They use, well, I mean, they use gRPC over sockets and protocol buffers and, and all of these fun things. Um, and it also doesn't work very well either. So uh, I guess I just put this in so that everyone knows that everything is terrible, but it's OK. We can be terrible together. So um, why are people doing this now? Like, this is kind of weird to have people working on supporting calling these random Python functions from Scala. Um, and I think uh, most people are actually not doing it for word count, as much as we all may love word count. Um, I think a lot of the reason why this is actually happening is people want to call the deep learning libraries, which are accessible in Python. Um, and the, the sort of questionable news is like, yeah, we can use these same techniques to call the deep learning libraries in Python. However, um, because of how the schedulers of these different things work, uh, it's not super resilient to failure, um, which is unfortunate. Like, doing word count is super resilient to failure. I can recompute any individual partition, which is, disappears from me. But if I try and use this with, say, TensorFlow, and I have executors preempted or otherwise fail for me, um, it, it just really doesn't work super great. Um, so people are also working on solving that problem. Uh, and if you, if you want to come join us on that, that, that is a thing which people are actively working on. On the other hand, if you, if you just want to call Spacey, or not, not just, if you want to call Spacey and use cool Python NLP tools, uh, you don't have to wait for a new scheduler to arrive. You can use these sort of really interesting hacks today. Um, and Apache Arrow is a large part of why solving, why doing this stuff has become reasonable. Um, until very recently, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to go back to this graph. Uh, right, we, we would have essentially always had to pay the, the penalty of working in the red line rather than the green line to be able to work with, uh, with Python code from, from the JVM. But now it's, it's getting a lot more reasonable, um, possibly 242 times more reasonable if you believe the internet, more likely 50% more reasonable if, if you believe me but definitely benchmark it for your own use case before you go ahead and rewrite all of your code to depend on things from a conference talk. Um, and so yeah, that's uh, Arrow's, Arrow's pretty awesome. Um, if anyone really likes writing low-level C code and JVM code and Python code, they need more of you. Um, I'm pretty sure there's at least an extra person somewhere in the world who likes solving that problem. I just don't know where they are. Um, and if, if you happen to know them, uh, definitely do, do introduce them to the project. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I should be clear, I really only talked about using Arrow here as a data interchange format. It also has a bunch of tools inside of it as well for doing analytics. Um, I just wanted to use the ones that I'm familiar with. But if you're the kind of person who's really interested in like super high performance, they have a bunch of stuff that operates directly on their serialized data. Um, if you would like to see me trying to make this work and fail, and trying again, and failing, and then eventually succeeding, I have a YouTube video of that. Um, I don't know if you like schadenfreude. It's, it's a very entertaining watch. Um, you can also just go and look at the version that works in GitHub. It's a lot simpler. Um, and there's a bunch of blog posts from different people. Uh, if you are interested in trying to serialize the spacey documents with the tokens, there is a serializer in there. Uh, we just have to figure out how to plug it into Cloud Pickle properly, um, which is the Spark serializer that we use. Um, and this is the second most important slide. This is the most important slide. Um, so there's a lot of books on Spark. If anyone wants to learn about Spark, um, there's some cool books. Uh, you probably don't want the Python-focused one. Um, and the version that I wrote, which is Learning Spark, um, is kind of out of date. But that should not stop you from buying my book. Um, just because it's not as useful, you should definitely still give me your money. High Performance Spark is a terrible introduction, but a great book for once you've already gone way too far to back out. And you're like, damn. I need to make my Spark pipeline work because I told my boss it was going to work. Um, <clears throat> High Performance Spark is the book which promises to maybe help you solve that problem. Not a guarantee. Um, if you have a cat, they like the box it comes in. If you don't have a cat, you can go get a cat. 
but mostly just buy this book. Um, it is not at all related to any of the things I talked about today uh, because all of these things started working after I wrote this book. But that should not stop you from buying it. Um, one copy of High Performance Spark can help a developer you know from turning to a life of enterprise support contracts. Um, and as someone who has written code that runs on a mainframe, um, that's real. OK, and so that's pretty much it. Um, I figured I'd save the last bit for questions because this is kind of very much an out there sort of approach to solving this problem. And I'm hoping someone has questions. Otherwise, uh, we can just uh, do an improvisational dance with my stuffed animals. Um, does anyone have questions? Anyone? Oh, man. I was really not counting on the improvisational dance. OK, this is my new stuffed animal. They were at the hotel last night. Their name is Wally the Walrus. And this is Boo. She travels with me everywhere. They will now dance. Okay. <laughs>